Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. This video is in response to a recent request to explain the relationship between impedance and SWR. Well, the fact is, impedance, SWR, return loss, and reflection coefficient are all entities that describe the same phenomenon just from different perspectives. They're all mathematically related to one another. In this video, I'm going to describe what each one is and then show how they are interrelated to one another. Look for the link to the formula sheet down in the description. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. I'm going to start at the foundational entity, the impedance. Well, we've all heard someone say something like, this antenna has an impedance of 130 ohms. Well, yes and no. At the most basic level, impedance is a complex quantity which consists of the real or purely resistive portion and the imaginary or purely reactive portion. The standard expression for impedance is impedance, or Z, is equal to the real portion R, which is the purely resistive portion, plus J times X, which is the purely reactive portion or imaginary portion, where J is that impossible but inescapable imaginary number the square root of minus one. This impedance can be plotted on a Cartesian coordinate system, that is, an xy axis. The horizontal or positive x axis is the real or resistive portion. The vertical or y axis is the imaginary or reactive portion. Now we have two kinds of reactants. We have inductive reactants and we have capacitive reactants. We can calculate inductive reactants with this formula. Inductive reactants, or X sub L, is equal to J times 2 times pi times F times L, where F is the frequency in hertz and L is the inductance in henrys. For capacitive reactants, we have that capacitive reactants, or X sub C, is equal to minus J, times the quantity 1 divided by 2 times pi times f times c, where f is the frequency in hertz and c is the capacitance in farads. Notice that the inductive reactance is always positive and the capacitive reactance is always negative. For this reason, Negative y values on our plot of impedance are capacitive reactants, and positive y values are inductive reactants. So what do they mean when they say that an antenna has an impedance of 130 ohms? They are most likely referring to the magnitude of the impedance, not the impedance itself. So suppose we had measured the impedance of an antenna to be 100 minus J83. We can plot this on our Cartesian coordinate system like this. This is the purely resistive portion of 100 ohms. And we have a capacitive reactance of 83 ohms. We plot the point on the chart for the impedance. Now we draw a line from the origin out to the plotted impedance. The magnitude of this impedance is the length of this line. It is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. The hypotenuse of the right triangle and thus the magnitude of the impedance is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the side. So in this case, the magnitude of impedance is equal to the square root of the quantity r squared plus x squared. So for our antenna, with an impedance of 100 minus J83, we would have that the magnitude of the impedance is equal to the square root of 100 squared plus 
minus 83 squared, which gives us the square root of 16,889. So the magnitude of our impedance ends up being 129.96 ohms. Boom! Our impedance of 130 ohms. With this foundation, we can move on to the next foundational entity, the reflection coefficient. At the heart of what the antenna analyzer and the nano VNA does is the reflection coefficient. This is what I call the impedance facing aspect of reflected power. The reflection coefficient is the base foundation for all of the others and it is represented by the Greek letter gamma. It describes how much of a wave is reflected by an impedance discontinuity in the transmission medium. Okay, so now I've confused you a little bit. Well, let's picture it this way. Here I am, I'm a transmitter with a purely resistive output impedance of 50 ohms. In other words, my output impedance is 50 plus zero J. Now, these don't actually exist, by the way. Now I'm looking out at the coax connected to my output and I'm seeing an impedance of 68 plus J25. Now this is not the same as my 50 plus J0. This is called an impedance discontinuity. And because these two impedances are not the same, some of the power that I'm trying to push out is going to be reflected back at me. This is true of any place along the transmission line where the impedance changes. One such change could be at an adapter along the way or where the coax connects to your antenna. How much of that power is reflected back at me is calculated from the two impedances in question. So here is the lovely, deceivingly simple formula for calculating the reflection coefficient. The reflection coefficient, or gamma, is equal to Z load, the impedance of your load, minus the impedance of your source, all divided by the impedance of the load, plus the impedance of the source. Now, this looks really simple, except we have to remember that all of these quantities are complex quantities, and the reflection coefficient is also a complex quantity. If we expand this out with all of its components, it looks like this. And this ends up being a real mathematical mess for most people to deal with. Fortunately, you have someone else that can do all of the heavy lifting for you. Excel does complex math, or you can use the free MathCAD clone Octave. I have a video on how to let Excel do the heavy lifting for you. Here is a link to that video if you're interested. In the case of our antenna with the 68 plus J25 impedance, the reflection coefficient comes out to be 0 0.1889 plus J 0.1718. Now, we're also going to be interested in the magnitude of the reflection coefficient, which is calculated the same way we calculated the magnitude of the impedance. So the magnitude of the reflection coefficient is equal to the square root of the real part of the reflection coefficient squared plus the imaginary part of the reflection coefficient squared. So for our example, the magnitude of the reflection coefficient would be equal to the square root of the square of 0 0.1889 plus the square of 0 0.1718, which gives us a value of 0 0.2554. Now, on to our next entity, the return loss. Well, this is what I'm going to be calling the power facing aspect of this scenario. It is expressed in terms of dB. It is an indication of how much power is being reflected back at the transmitter due to an impedance discontinuity between the transmitter and the load. If this was a perfect mismatch, like a complete open or a complete short, <laughs> 
then 100% of the transmitter's power would be coming back. But it's not a perfect mismatch, and as such, less than 100% is being reflected back. We can calculate this using the actual incident or forward power and the reflected power using this formula. Return loss in dB is equal to 10 times the log to the base 10 of the reflected power divided by the forward power. Now, in our example case, we are transmitting 100 watts, and we measure 6.523 watts coming back at us. Putting this into our equation, we get that return loss in dB is equal to 10 times the log to the base 10 of 6.523 watts divided by 100 watts, which gives us a return loss in dB of minus 11.86 dB. But you know, this can also be seen in terms of the impedance discontinuity through the eyes of the reflection coefficient that we just talked about. The equation for this is very simple once you have calculated the magnitude of the reflection coefficient. Return loss in dB is equal to 20 times the log to the base 10 of the magnitude of the reflection coefficient. So, considering this using the same situation as before, we have a transmitter which is outputting power to a load. The previously described load has an impedance of 68 plus J25. We've already calculated the magnitude of the reflection coefficient as 0.2554. So, return loss in dB is equal to 20 times the log to the base 10 of 0.2554, which gives us a return loss of minus 11.86 dB. Now, on to the final and most often spoken about entity, SWR. SWR, or more properly, VSWR, is what I call the voltage-facing entity associated with this whole picture. One of the things that we have to be aware of is that voltages on a transmission line are not the simple entities we often think about. Like the impedance, they are complex entities with both real and imaginary components. This would be expressed like 34 minus J12 volts. Now, in an everyday setting, when we talk about RF voltages, we're talking about the magnitude of this voltage. But more than that, we're talking about the RMS value, which is an expression of the DC equivalent of the voltage. And, well, that is another topic altogether. Now, back to our VSWR. Have you ever been to a pond and thrown a rock into the pond? Watch as the ripples from the thrown rock travel across the water until they encounter something like a floating dock. Some of the energy of that ripple causes a reflected ripple back off of the dock toward the origin of the original ripples. Notice how the incident ripple from the rock thrown and the reflected ripples interact. A similar picture can be made about the RF waves as they travel down a transmission line. The reflected RF power causes standing waves to occur as they interact with the incident RF power. There are voltage maximums and voltage minimums in these standing waves. The VSWR is a ratio of the magnitude of the maximum voltage and the magnitude of the minimum voltage in the standing waves along the transmission line. If you know these maximum and minimum values, then you can calculate the VSWR with this simple formula. VSWR is equal to the magnitude of the maximum voltage divided by the magnitude of the minimum voltage. They have special slotted line test equipment that they use to measure these maximums and minimums. But very few of us average experimenters have the capability to measure these voltages. We have to rely on getting the same information by other ways. So how do we do this? Well, we can choose to calculate it from the magnitude of the reflection coefficient, the impedance-facing entity, using this formula.
the SWR is equal to 1 plus the magnitude of the reflection coefficient divided by 1 minus the magnitude of the reflection coefficient. So with our example, we calculated the magnitude of the reflection coefficient to be 0 0.2554. This gives us an SWR of 1.691. Now we can also calculate it from the return loss or the power facing entity using this formula. The SWR is equal to 1 plus 10 brought to the return loss over 20 power, all divided by 1 minus 10 brought to the return loss over 20 power. We had a return loss of minus 11.86 dB. So the calculated SWR would be 1.691. to Then we could also use the forward and reflected power with this formula. The SWR is equal to 1 plus the square root of the reflected power divided by the forward power, all divided by 1 minus the square root of the reflected power divided by the forward power. We had an incident power of 100 watts and a reflected power of 6.523 watts. This gives us an SWR of, well, 1.691. to Now, as you can probably see, all of these are mathematically related, and any one of them can be calculated from any other one. Well, don't forget that I've prepared a formula sheet for you with all of these equations in it, plus a bunch more stuff. The link to this sheet is in the description below. Hopefully, all of this makes more sense to you now than it did before. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.